TBCN presents Creating Your Own Job, a new series aimed at providing you with resources and assistance to start your own business. Financial assistance, analyzing the marketplace, marketing strategies, implementing the plan. Creating Your Own Job. Welcome to another edition of Creating Your Own Job, a series that's devoted to helping you start or expand your business. We've had a great uh, deal of different topics on. Today we're going to be talking about how to finance uh, a new business. I'm Louise Thompson, the Executive Director of Tampa Bay Community Network, where you can come down, take training, learn video production, and have your own show just like this one. Uh, we're very fortunate today to have with us Bill Jackson, who's a professor of entrepreneurship and innovation, and the director of Sustainable Entrepreneurship and Innovation Alliance at USF St. Pete. Welcome, Bill. Thank you for coming down to see us. Well, Louise, thank you for inviting me. I look forward to talking about entrepreneurship today. Thank you. Scott Price, who's a CPA and managing director at A-Line or A-Line? A-Line. A-Line, CPAs, LLC. Welcome to you, Scott. Thank you very much for having us here. Francis Wimberly is the president of the Tampa Bay Black Business Investment Corporation, Inc. And we're glad you could make it, Francis. Well, Thanks thank so you. much. Thank you for inviting us. I'm glad to be here. Bill, why don't you tell us about this brand new, spanking new program over at USF St. Pete? OK, great. And what you do. OK, well, I'm not sure I can tell you everything I do, but uh, we're very excited. And we decided about two years ago uh, to start an entrepreneurship program at USF St. Petersburg. And I, for a long time, have had a passion, and I think that's really what this show is about, um, that higher education has never really convinced students uh, that self-venturing is a viable career option. They've taught them to uh, work for major corporations, uh, but they've really ignored the fact that we have some very talented uh, young kids uh, that have maybe a different skill set than uh, I had at that age. Uh, and we want to at least convince them that that's a viable option for them. So the Sustainable Entrepreneurship and Innovation Alliance uh, has as, as its foundation the academic program. And so we started this major in entrepreneurship. It's the only the second uh, major in entrepreneurship at state universities in the state of Florida. Uh, maybe later I can tell you about the full curriculum. I don't want to monopolize the time. Uh, we do think we have one of the most innovative curriculums in not only the nation, but the world. Uh, so we have at that foundation of our alliance the academic program. Uh, we have also a very active student club that grew to over 170 members uh, at our university within its first year of operations. We've got a small business development center office on campus that comes under that umbrella. Uh, we also started, and many of you may have, have seen some news on that, uh, the Gazelle Lab, which is a business accelerator program. Uh, and we also have an academic journal uh, that's a part of that program. If so. you graduate from that, do you get to go over to Bush Gardens? Or? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't help myself. <laughs> Scott, tell me about a line. A line, thank and you. And you and what you do. Just as Bill was saying, I sort of got kicked in the entrepreneurship uh, uh, arena. I started out my career after uh, attending Florida State and was with Arthur Anderson down in here in Tampa. As uh, folks know, Arthur Anderson imploded back in 2002, and at 26 years old, I found myself looking for a new uh, position and decided to go ahead and try it on my own, try my own CPA firm at 26. Um, I did that from 26 to 33 and sold that firm in 2009, um, sort of at the height of the revenue, height of the, of the um, sort of before the bubble 
burst to some degree, um, and then started up uh, Align CPAs. We're a specialized CPA firm. We focus on auditing outsourcers, information technology auditing. Um, we don't do any financial audit work or tax work. It's a very specialized business. Um, our clients locally include Raymond James and the Mayo Clinic, and we sold our first job in France just this week. So um, it's, uh, it's something that has been uh, exciting for me as an entrepreneur and going through the process of financing my own business, both at 26 and then again at 33, and I've made some uh, mistakes um, and some successes, and I look forward to sharing those with, uh, with you today. Scott, I just don't know how anybody learns anything without making mistakes. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> just, why bother? I mean, just go out, make a few mistakes, and you really get a lesson right away. A couple of them. Francis, tell us about your organization. Okay, well, what the Tampa Bay Black Business Investment Corporation does is make loans to African-American-owned businesses and other small businesses. Uh, we were established back in 1987 through the Small Business Assistance Act, through, through legislation, where the legislators recognized the fact that African-Americans uh, were not getting their share of small business loans. So they created the Black Business Investment Board, and they were charged to go out in the major metropolitan areas and create Black Business Investment Corporations. Uh, in 1987, uh, former Mayor Friedman from Tampa and Mayor Ulrich from St. Petersburg decided they wanted a Black Business Investment Corporation in the Tampa Bay area, thus we were born. Um, we were capitalized to the tune of $1.6 million, and one, with that $1.6 million, uh, we've made over $12 million in loans and over uh, 1,000 jobs since inception. We need to know how you turn that $1 million into yeah. $12 million yeah. because <laughs> we've got to keep this place going, and yeah. we don't know how to do mm -hmm. that. But we'll talk to you about okay. that soon. So today we said we were going to talk to people, help people figure out how to finance their business. I'm going I'm to actually start with you, Scott, because I, I remember when I was going to start my advertising marketing company, which I ran for 20 years before this gig, the first place I went was my CPA to ask, so what would it cost me to start a marketing PR company? Do people come and ask you that kind of question? And uh, how do you figure it out? Because she specifically asked me what kind of business and all of that. No, that's a great question. People all the time say, hey, I would like to have a business, but maybe you don't understand all of the costs involved in a business, whether it's professional liability insurance, whether it's the startup of your documents and, the, and so forth, uh, the taxes that you may have to provide to have a license. As a CPA, I have a license in every state that I do business in. So if I have 24 states, you're having three, $400 of licenses as you go through. So a lot of these things are costs that they need to be looking at. So you ask someone to do a lot of research, and now clearly uh, with, the, with the technology available to us, we're able to out, you're able to see what type of business you, you have, what type of insurance, license are required, taxes. Um, are you going to offer health insurance to your employees down the road or not? Are you going to have a 401k plan? So a lot of these things that they need to determine, you may not have them all today, but you're going to have them in the future and figure those costs as you go through. So as they come in, it's a lot of the hidden costs that they don't think of. They say, well, I can go get my business cards done here and my stationery and so forth, but they don't forget about some other things. As I know like as I- Like paying themselves, for example. Exactly. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's the one I think I forgot. <laughs> um, and a lot of people do say, um, am I supposed to get a W, I've gotten a W-2 for so many years. Is that how I'm supposed to do it? Well, you're a business owner now. You may have, and again, you go into your CPA first, you may have to elect yourself as an S corporation with the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service. And because of that, you're taxed differently than if you were a General Motors, General or C corporation. And so you need to consider, okay, do I get a distribution or do I just run payroll? Then if you involve payroll, and there's payroll taxes involved. You have the employee and the employer side of FICA or Social Security consider, Medicare taxes. So there's a lot of taxes that people need to consider of when they pay themselves sometimes paying themselves out of the business as a distribution to owners or return of your equity because maybe you went out and you invested ten thousand dollars in to start the business and you build that capital up and you say i'm going to take some of that capital out and you can do that through a distribution um, and, but then again there's self-employment taxes involved with that as well so people really need to consider all of those things and it is complicated but doing it right from the beginning is going to save you a lot at the end because I can tell you the uh, Department of Revenue and the IRS, they're all going to look for their dollars and make sure and people not checking a box correctly or not filing a certain form on time is just a, they, it's an unintentional mistake that they did. 
but the dollars could be costly for them. I remember the nightmare of the Florida Department of Revenue. If I didn't owe them tax, and I, so I didn't fill out the form, I owed them money anyway, because <laughs> you cannot ignore them. No. They're like, hello, you were supposed to put this form in on the 10th of the month or whatever those dates were then, otherwise you owe us 50 bucks even if you made nothing, or whatever it was, but just an awful thing. Francis, when you are helping uh, minority companies get funded, do, they go, do you go through this process with them about what kind of money they're going to need, or do you check all, all that against what they're thinking? We do. We require a business plan, and then the business plan will tell them exactly how much money they need to start the business, grow their business, um, buy their equipment, whatever they need. And, and then we, we review the business plan, we review their financial statements, we, we review their uh, projections, we also review their credit. Before you're going to hand over any money. Uh, long before we hand over any yeah, money. <laughs> okay. You, Bill, you have classes in financing or uh, part of your curriculum? Yeah. Actually, what's unique about our curriculum is that all of our students take the general business core that any other business student uh, takes. They'll take accounting, they'll take finance, marketing, economics. But uh, beyond that, in terms of entrepreneurship, our curriculum is, is, is very unique. Our students begin with a course in creativity which is, a, and the way we teach it is a systematic way of creative problem solving. And we think that's kind of at the foundation uh, of our curriculum. Students move on to a new venture creation course where we teach another skill that's becoming extremely popular, especially in the investment community, uh, which is business modeling. And the, the short story on that is, Basically, businesses need to understand uh, the value that they're creating for their customers and the value that they're creating for themselves as an organization. And the information gathered through the business modeling leads to developing the business plan that Francis talked about. Uh, they move on to a course in scalability, and we're, I think, the only university in the U.S. that teaches this course even though it's probably one of the greatest problems that most entrepreneurs face. And how do you grow your firm? What are those pitfalls in this growth process? Uh, they, the final course that they take is a course in student consulting with firms that are high growth and that are going through our business accelerator program. And the, here the students are, are, are given the opportunity to see what goes on in the kitchen. So they're getting their hands dirty, working with these uh, firms that are going through our own accelerator program. But yes, they're exposed to finance, getting back to your question, but they're also exposed to all of the other disciplines in business. Scott, have you seen where people can uh, come in and underestimate their financial needs and then fail for that reason and what what is the typical thing that they've forgotten besides as I pointed out my salary yeah well you bring up a great point so many entrepreneurs think that they can leave their job that they're at now and go out and make the same amount of money at the beginning and so and not and also not understand the bottom line with all the other expenses involved in financing the business so you see them come in and say okay I'm gonna make exactly what I was making before no, you have to be prepared for a big pay cut. You pay yourself last. As, as man director of the line, I get paid last. When we have enough money to pay everybody else, which we always do, then Scott can get a bonus. Scott can talk about a salary adjustment, et cetera. So a lot of people do underestimate expenses associated with that because what they forget is, depending upon the small business that you have, if it's in retail, you may get your dollars much quicker than if it's professional services. If you're an attorney, if you're a CPA, another type of business that may have different payment terms, you're, gonna, you're going to do a project and you may bill and it's 30 days. And if you're dealing with a large company, they know you're a small guy possibly, so they're gonna wait 
30 days to pay you. You don't have that much leverage possibly. So you see people not say, well, I did this work, but you may not get paid till 60 days because your contract says that you're going to bill at the end of the month and then you're going to get paid in 30 days. And it may get your invoice may get caught up. And so it may be 60 days before you get paid. So I think some people not only underestimate expenses that may pop up, but they also underestimate the cycle time to get paid on their revenue side. I think that's something that entrepreneurs need to and pay attention to. And I think you're hitting on something else that we ought to talk about, which is if you had a product versus a service, mm -hmm. they're just two different animals. Mm -hmm. With a product, if you didn't sell it last week, you still have the product, you could probably sell it this week if you discounted it or did some big promo. But if you're selling your time, you're done because last week's gone and you have this other <laughs> you can't 40, sell, you cannot sell. sell that anymore. I don't have any more of that. Yeah. Yeah. That went bye-bye, so I lost all that per hour rate that I thought I could uh, earn by consulting or doing whatever it is we're doing, right? You, you it's know, a you, big point. It's a great point that you bring up, and I tell people as a CPA that firm, that's what we do is sell time. And when that week has passed, we can't sell anymore. So we have 52 weeks. You can figure, figure people's vacation. And people also need to understand as an entrepreneur, your employers are going to have issues. Medical issues come up. Family issues come up. And you got to prepare yourself for those things. So you may think, OK, I have 40 weeks of billable time with this person. But then something came up. I need to readjust the schedule, juggle it, et cetera. And again, at the end of the day, that work's going to fall to you as the entrepreneur and the owner of the business. And so you need to be prepared for that. And as time approaches where you may not be able to sell that week because let's say if there's a product they walk in your building and they buy that that item from you right then it's it's sold whereas if there's preparation you have to do to get ready to sell do your service or ready for that product for them that you need to figure that into account as well because if it's going to take us four weeks to get ready to do somebody's audit and you see now okay i have an open spot now six weeks away five weeks away four weeks away well, when it's at three weeks away, that week gets a lot cheaper than it was at six <laughs> weeks as well. So those are uh -huh. the things entrepreneurs, especially like, like um, Francis was saying, when their business plan is put together, they may not get that revenue every single time because they may need to discount the rate initially for someone to buy into them as a new business. What does it typically take? I remember years ago when I started one of my first businesses, which I think I did five of them or four or five of them, that uh, they would tell you that it would take you three to five years to actually see a return. Francis, is that still the case or is it like, you know, you're, you're paying these bills and doing things but nobody knows you're there yet for a while? Normally, I, mm. I think it's like three years. Um, I've got a business as well, aside from BBIC, and um, in that business, we're just breaking even and I've been mm. in, in it three years, a little over three years now. And you're doing it part time? Well. Yes. Yeah. What, of course. Is, what are you teaching to over there, Bill? Is it going to take so long? Actually, I mean, not everybody yeah. can go build a computer in their garage or something right. and then end up being a billionaire or yeah. whatever, whatever it is. We but but that is one of the areas that we do focus our curriculum on is on high growth ventures, and they run into exactly the same problems mm -hmm. that that you're talking about. Uh, there may be funds available through raising capital. Uh, but that's a difficult uh, equation for many of those businesses. In fact, I, I, I think we really have two death valleys of financing uh, when it comes to entrepreneurial firms. I think we have those uh, mom and pop, small businesses who really don't have access to almost any capital in starting their business. And then at the other end of the continuum, we have those high growth ventures and we're certainly in an area right now that we could improve uh, in the Tampa Bay area in terms of, of having uh, investment capital available for entrepreneurs. Uh, in fact, that's uh, really uh, at the uh, core of a, um, a recent initiative that, that I'm a co-author on, which is the Tampa Bay 620 plan. Uh, which is a call to action for the entrepreneurship community um, to build those funds in this area. We have some great companies, high growth companies that we're losing in Tampa Bay because they don't have that capital and it does take that three to five years to really um, build that strength in the financial area. Where is the money, Scott? 
Where, where can I find money if I want to start uh, any type of business, or is it different depending on what type of business it is? And I think that it definitely is going to be different upon what type of business it is. I think one of the things that people think about when they're financing a business is may say, well, I can go to so-and-so to get this money, possibly as a family member, relative, or a friend. And what I would make sure that they're cautious of is setting this up as a loan or a note is much better than making that person an owner in the company. Because they may say, hey, I need them to be involved, or that person says, I may want to be an owner. But they may be a silent owner. If they feel like they're financing the business, then they're calling the shots, but you're doing all the work. So people will look to family and friends for that um, it, to, to some degree. And I would say make sure that when they do so, they have it in a situation where that's a loan or a note rather than any type of, of equity interest in the organization. I know for me, when I was 26, I looked to see what credit card I had the, <laughs> the val uh, available credit on and sold my home and moved into a one bedroom, one bath apartment and hunkered down on my expenses and, uh, and, and financed it that way. You know, I had a $5,000 credit card limit and on one of the cards and I was profitable before I had spent that limit. Um, another way for other businesses is through local community banks. Your community bank is a great way to go out and get loans. Um, they want to loan money in this area. And uh, again, going to, to one of the points I was made on financials and business plans, they're going to want to just see, just mm -hmm. like with Francis, is the business plan and then also the financials associated with it. But then one thing to keep in mind is they're going to want to see those financials continuously. They want to see an annual financial statement. Mm -hmm. They want to see a quarterly accounts receivable report. So it's making sure that you get with your CPA and have very good books so you can reduce this financial information to them. Then there is obviously the governmental loan side where there are, are, are different um, agencies where you can go through the SBA and those types of things um, to have these dollars. But the main point that I wanted to make sure is people understand so many times these dollars might be personally guaranteed. When you have a note with a bank or a note with, with, your, with your friend or family member, you're personally guaranteeing those dollars. And that's always something that you need to consider before you go out. It's just like getting a car loan or getting a credit card. At the end of the day, if the business fails and you don't have the revenue you expected from it, you still owe that money. But this is Florida and it's tough to take your house. That's, that's true. Isn't it? Yes. Uh, nobody that's, wants your house right nobody, now. Well, that's, <laughs> that's one and two. It's hard with yeah. our very stringent uh, homestead laws, yeah, right? Bankruptcy. Yeah. I, I think you hit on something interesting with uh, uh, structuring a loan you might get from a family member or a friend or someone you know, your Aunt Tilly has a lot of money. And you go there and you want to make sure that they're either a silent partner in it. And I think one of the ways you can sell that, if I put my marketing hat on for a minute, mm -hmm is to tell Aunt Tilly, I don't, I don't want you to be a partner because I would expose you to liability mm -hmm. if you were a real partner. And so I'd rather you were a silent partner, you don't make any decisions, and the most you could lose is what you gave me. Francis, is that right? That's correct, yeah. because um, once you make a loan, anybody that owns over 20% of the business has to guarantee. They have to? You they mean have under to. law? Under law. Mm -hmm. oh, they're, un guaranteeing, under, they're, they're guaranteeing the loan. They're guaranteeing actual document, the loan that they, if uh, the company doesn't pay it back, they'll pay it back. Oh, I meant if an individual uh, was giving you the money, but you're it's saying same. if if someone is a partner, it, it is not considered a silent partner. Right. It's considered part right. of the mm -hmm. business. But that they would still be liable for any other money that the owner might pay. Exactly. The, the business exactly. person. Exactly. What happens when you're, with your funding for Black Enterprise, can people also, uh, who apply for that, mm -hmm. can they also be uh, borrowing from other sources too? They can, but we prefer to, when they start out, start with us completely. And that way we graduate them from us into a bank. Uh, okay, so you get them started and exactly. you say, okay, move that along and exactly. then we'll, we'll help a new business as well. Right. Is it harder to make a decision to finance a company that is um, service oriented than, than product or manufacturing oriented because usually that's the person. Like I remember mm -hmm. when I went into business, the, it's me that right. I'm selling really. So they, you know, there's nobody there if I'm not there. So there, the likelihood of mm -hmm. financing that was seemed to be less. Right, for us, uh, depends on 
what the collateral is um, and what type of business you're in. We have uh, several programs that we I started that uh, is, is there to help our customers. If you're in a, a business where you're providing a product to the city, county, state, somewhere like that, and you have a contract with them, we can take an assignment of the contract proceeds and make that loan. And as you get, as the uh, invoices are submitted to the city, county, state, or whoever they're with, uh, then we make a loan. Mm -hmm. uh, in that amount? In that, that amount of the, of the invoice, yes. And then when it's paid back, it's paid directly to us because we've already given you your money, and that helps your cash flow keep going. Mm -hmm. If you're in a, in, um, in a service business and you have a contract with the city, county, state, or someone like that, we can do the exact same thing. Once you submit that invoice to the um, construction manager or whoever you're working with, then we can take an assignment of that um, invoice, make the loan. When it's paid back, money's sent to us. Do you make loans to uh, new enterprises that don't have any record yet? Yes, we do. We do startups and we do existing businesses. What factors into doing giving money to somebody who has really no record yet. One of the things that we look at is their experience. Nine times out of ten you go into business that you have experience in. And we also look at the credit. Credit uh, plays a big part in our decision making and we look at the projections. Um, that's basically how we look at it. Can you add to this bill about where people can find money? And Yeah, I, I'll give a good example. I'm, I'm also uh, one of the co-founders of Gazelle Lab. And we started an early stage investment fund associated with that business accelerator. Of course, we were looking at companies that we had gauged that had the potential to grow very quickly and, and significantly. Um, th that type of investment from the community is, is needed here. But just like gauging the potential of a startup mm -hmm. uh, that's a mom and pop type business. You're really gauging potential. Mm -hmm. And what we teach in our program is first of all, uh, ensuring that um, we have identified who our customer segments are. Uh, we make sure that we're adding value to those. That they're they're um, supportable assumptions in terms of the revenue stream and the cost structure. Uh, and that those individuals are able to sell their idea. Uh, what we're looking at with that particular group is a, an investor that is willing to invest on the upside as, mm -hmm. as opposed to the downside of investing. Um, firms that we are working with in, in the accelerator, uh, unfortunately, are very difficult to bootstrap. And we teach mm -hmm. bootstrapping, and bootstrapping is as is in uh, Scott case, is, is much easier to do. But when you're trying to bring some new product to market, uh, you've got a lot of additional development costs that it's very difficult to find financing uh, for. You brought up something I think all of you probably uh, can talk about, and that is a person uh, will often have experience in a field, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm and they decide they want to go into that field. They usually overestimate what they can get, as you pointed out. You know, the guy who does my plumbing does it for a big firm. They charge a lot of money. He doesn't get that much. Does he think he's going to go get that as much as they're billing for? But, you know, they run a whole business and they've got all these other things going. Uh, he could be a great plumber. I think what a lot of people don't think about is the sales aspect mm -hmm. of things. Isn't that where mm -hmm. the, the, a huge problem is done? Just you mentioned teaching people how to creatively brainstorm, mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, the stock and trade of a good entrepreneur. Shift, 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 shift. Mm -hmm. shift. Okay, let's try this now. That didn't work. Uh -huh. I gave that two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I gave that two weeks. Okay, let's try something yeah. else. All right. One of the things that's really hard, and I know I met many a client you know, while I ran my marketing business, who had really wonderful credentials in whatever it is they were doing, mm -hmm. service or uh, retail orientation or something like that, some product or manufacturing thing, but they, they really, many of them, couldn't figure out how to sell that stuff. Mm -hmm. So what, 
can you, uh, you were in a business, mm -hmm. you, have, you have a side business, yeah. you're teaching it. Mm -hmm. what, what do you say about that? And what kind of advice can we give viewers about such a topic? It's, it is one of the most hardest, uh, harder things to do. I, I, uh, I joked, I just became chair of the Florence Institute of CPAs in the article. I joked that in the Times, when I started my first firm at 26, I didn't want the St. Petersburg Times to put my age in there because I didn't want anyone to know how young I was out there selling them their audit. Because like you said, if you're a service-oriented business, they are buying you. Mm -hmm. And so you really need to worry about getting yourself to market. It needs to depend on whether your business is going to be locally based or whether it's something that you're going to do um, internet-wide, where we have our clients around the world, well, those dollars are different. I mean, that costs Google or Yahoo, you know, mm -hmm. doing some, uh, some paid-per-click advertising where someone goes online, types in a search term, and finds you. Well, those, that adds up over time, those costs do for that. Or the marketing side of loan, uh, joining your chamber of commerce or finding a specific niche for your product or service. And people don't realize the costs involved in entertaining potential clients, getting them to sign. I think, it's, I think the biggest thing that you pointed out was the cost side of it. When I started at 26, I told my clients, it's the same people, but it's just going to be a half the price. Because mm -hmm. I knew they would have to bite because they need to return on investment. They're going to make an investment on you because just like you were saying to Francis earlier, somebody who's never had a track record of doing that on their own. So they're making an investment in you. You have to make an investment in them. And you know we call them our charter clients. They got charter mm -hmm. pricing when we started out, which was very different when we were you know, whopping nine, 10 years in business. Mm -hmm. That was very different for us. Um, so that's something that people need to consider. And I think a great point that you make is your pricing is going to be very different. And also given the economy, the pricing that we have now back compared to 2006, 2004, very different pricing as well. Mm -hmm. So as the economy goes, your pricing is going to go, but initially being a no name or not having a reputation, you yourself have a reputation, but they don't know, you know, you're a plumber, you know, everyone knows Bob the plumber, but no one knows ABC plumbing or whatever it may be. You know, they know ABC plumbing, but they don't know Bob the plumber. And that's right. something mm -hmm. that people need to realize that to get that first person to bite, they're going to have to do stuff for free. They're going to have to do stuff for heavily reduced. And, and that, again, needs to figure into the cash flow side of things of, of what to do. And, um, you know, going back to the financing side of it, the, the money, it's not like, you know, people seeing things is going to be a Facebook or something else where the funding's out there. Guys from Silicon Valley stay in Silicon Valley. They won't even come to the East Coast at all. Atlanta funding people may only stay in Atlanta. So in this area, the capital is tight. And so it's knowing where to go and talking to the right people and joining some other mm -hmm. business organizations that may have access to the people. Because you may not be able to get a whole fund, but you can find one guy at a private equity firm who may say, you know what, I'll give that, I'll take a chance in that business. This could be a real breakthrough for me. And I'll give them seed money personally. Mm -hmm. So it's making sure that you go out to these organizations and look for, as you look for the financing side of it, um, it may not be that your, your first choice of, over the way that you start out in the business may not be the exact choice of finance you'd like long term, but it's the seed money you need to get mm -hmm. started. And just as Francis said, then you're going to graduate to another organization or another way of, of equity funding. And I know you have a lot more to tell me about that. We're going to take a quick break. Please stay tuned. Hi, I'm Hillsborough County Commissioner Kevin Beckner, and you're watching the Tampa Bay Community Network. Welcome back to Creating Your Own Job, and today we've been talking about financing your business. I'm Louise Thompson with Tampa Bay Community Network, and uh, just to reintroduce Bill Jackson of the uh, USF St. Pete Entrepreneurship and Innovation major, Scott Price is a CPA, and Francis Wimberly, president of the Tampa Bay Black Business Investment Corporation. We've all been talking about getting financing for our business. And we just talked about marketing. Uh, some people have a wonderful idea, very creative, tremendous skills at what they do, but may not know how to market themselves. And Scott was just talking about maybe sometimes what you have to do is get involved in your local community or chambers. Mm -hmm. Um, so that you expand the people that you know and also look at marketing yourself from a pricing standpoint, which I remember mm -hmm. doing. I joined the chamber right away. I charged the least amount ever to build a portfolio of the logo designs we had, the brochures, the ads. 
uh, that we put in local and national press to look like, you know, I have all of this, but it was the cheapest rate in the universe, right? So that's one way to do it, mm -hmm. to is. price yourself lower. Um, I also thought when you said, well, you were 26 years old when you started your business, so that's what you had to do. But I had a guy once who was 26 years old, who was 22, just came out of USF with three friends. They started a business. And what am I going to do? I'm 22. I can't tell anybody how old I am. And I said, let's emphasize that. You're fresh out of school. You have more knowledge about new technology than anybody. And we went the other direction. Because I often think that you are, what you think is your weakness, what we all think is our greatest weakness and strength are the same thing. I think it's, what you're saying is correct. Um, we talked about earlier about uh, if ha opening a, a, job, a business in which you have experience in. We had a customer that was a loan client. Yes, um, she's a major production person for a vision chain, and she said, "Well, if I can do it for them, I can do it for me." Right. She opened a home business, and uh, we made a loan to her, and then we uh, went to the bank and got a, a loan for, from the bank where we guaranteed, and then she didn't need us. Um, and she's doing really well now. She didn't have to go actually through you. you. She used you as a network. She had to go through us even to get the loan because she was a startup, and banks don't make loans to startups. Okay, but you're mm -hmm. guaranteeing it, right. so then, mm -hmm. then they're okay. Right. Mm -hmm. um, we talked at the break that there were um, a number of uh, requirements that people have to get funding from uh, your agency. One of the requirements is uh, we require, number one, a business plan. Uh, your personal t uh, tax returns, and if it's a startup, business tax returns on an annual basis, uh, business uh, financial statements, and they can go to Scott for that. Um, and also um, the personal tax, the personal financial statements on an annual basis. Quarterly, we need business uh, business uh, financial statements, accounts receivable, agings, just a whole gamut of whatever's required to get a business loan. What is the range of the loans that you have provided since you're, you're around about 10 years or so? Mm, around about that. 25 years 25 now. 25 years, mm -hmm. wow. The average is about $35,000, $40,000 right now. Mm -hmm. But you've we had have a some, higher range? It's been, no, it's been lower. Oh. But we've, we do have some loans. Recently, we made a $193,000 loan. So that kind of bumped our average up. The lowest loan I've done was 5000 The funding comes through, through the county, the city, and no, the state, or? No, through the BBIC. We actually do the underwriting, uh, the documents, the collecting, everything. Where do you get the money? Our well, money, now you mean you're getting it from the loans you put out? Or? Yes. Well, our, our money comes from uh, the major financial institutions along with some of the community banks, and then uh, we get money from the state as well. We're appropriated on an annual basis, uh, monies from the legislators. Okay, so there is funding that's come. So it's, some of it right. is taxpayer money anyway. Exactly. And mm -hmm. it, does everyone need to be black to for get the, the loan or no? For the uh, Black Business Loan Program, yes. But we have funds from financial institutions that we can use for other uh, businesses. Well, do they need to be a minority or a women or? No. They could be anybody? Yes. And they can still come through your right. organization mm -hmm. to do that? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, how about, Bill, you add to some of this discussion because you've got this big curriculum going on. Okay. I, yeah, I would like to return to something that you and Scott mentioned in terms of uh, lenders mm -hmm. invest in the person. And, and I, mm -hmm. I think we take that a step further. You know, uh, investors invest in the entire management team, mm -hmm. uh, uh, not just the, the owner. And, and, and we think that it's very important um, for these businesses to understand those skill gaps that they may have in their management team. And even if they don't have the financing uh, to fully fill all of those gaps, look for other ways of filling it. Work with the SBDCs, mm -hmm. work with SCORE, look at the uh, local universities in the area in the seminars that they may be offering. Look for internships uh, within those uh, universities. But make sure that you understand where your shortcomings are as far as that entire uh, management team is concerned. Um, the other thing that struck me, and, and, and it's, it's, it's one of my philosophies, you know, uh, especially for the small startup, 
uh, we generally do have to rely on credit cards. We do have to rely on loans from families and friends. And what that typically drives those businesses uh, to do is to seek less money than they truly need to come in there correctly capitalized to be successful in their business. I think most of the literature will suggest that, that small businesses fail because of, of management problems. I personally feel that most fail because of undercapitalization and the inability to hide those management problems. Which is a management problem. Which is a management <laughs> problem. <laughs> Put that way. I know you're going to add to that. I'm yeah. sure you are because yeah. you're a money guy. Yeah. So, yes, they're underfunded. They are, but there's, you know, and I, this goes back to the point of starting out your, your new business. There are many ways that you can look bigger than you are possibly, have the right resources. So, um, for instance, there's virtual offices in Tampa. Mm -hmm. So you can have an address on, you know, West Shore or downtown or wherever it may be, and it's $200 a month, but you work out of your house. And it looks more professional than having on your business card your home address. Um, there are uh, there's um, automated voice answering services that you have. For instance, our phones go through a company in New Jersey that um, has a toll-free number, and we paid someone fifty dollars one time to record a nice British accent uh, <laughs> and welcoming them to our firm and so forth. So there's lots of things that businesses can do um, that don't cost a lot of money. You don't need to have someone up front as a receptionist or you know working in a certain capacity. I think people in the service model need to really look out there. There's so many businesses that are there to support small business when you look at the number of small businesses that are being created and then as you look at the capitalization requirements there's a lot people don't have the capital out there to invest so you can do a lot of virtual offices the uh, the internet phones IP phones things like that that you can save dollars on rather than going out of the gate saying I need to have this big office but then I think people need to realize if you're in the service industry like you were saying earlier if you're not there, you're not making money. So your vacations are decreased drastically before. You got a paycheck mm -hmm. all the time from the, uh, if you're the plumber, if you work at, at a retail place, whatever it may be, you got your paycheck all the time if you weren't there because you might be on salary. You're not going to get your paycheck if you're not working at all until you build the business up. So that's one thing, you know, I'm sure many of us have been in these shoes where we don't go, you know, two years before you get any time off because you need the money to make it. And then also, as you do financing a business, um, the thing to look at is reserve requirements of what you need to have money-wise down the road. Because you're going to hit lean times. You mm -hmm. need to prepare for those. And when you have a responsibility as a business owner, I think you have a fiduciary responsibility to, some of your, to your employees as well. They're counting on you to spend the money judiciously. One of the things that we see a lot happen is my other friends that start businesses or other businesses I hear of, they run car allowances through, they go out and get the nice cars, they go do this, they do that, they get a both day money run through the business. Those are all no-nos. You need to operate the business and spend the money like it's your own. And mm -hmm. therefore, you need to make sure you separate business and personal because those employees that you have are doing the same thing. And so that's something that I want people to think about is, if I go through a lean time, and I'm sure not for profits, you guys have it as well. What reserve requirements do we have need to have if we don't get our funding from the state, from the city, from the county, from other private donors? We need to have three months because these people are counting mm -hmm. on you. Now, one of the things I think has come up more so is the number of contingent workforce that's out there where you may not, I know in my business, professional services, you may look at it and go, gee, I've got enough work for one month for somebody, but not possibly for the next three. Well, a lot more people will look to a contract to perm position rather than bring it on permanently. And mm -hmm. that then has some tax consequences as well for both parties to outline because they're an independent contractor to you rather than an employee possibly. And those are things to consider and talk about with your CPA. So I think a small business 20, 30 years ago where maybe you had that brick and mortar and you need to have all these things, technology has helped us reduce those capitalization costs but still, a rainy day may come, and we need to prepare for that when you have your own business. And sometimes you think you need more than you need. Uh, mm -hmm. I know uh, starting a marketing PR company uh, when I did in the 80s, um, absolutely, I thought I needed an image. If I'm going to sell you that I'm going to give you an image, I must have one. I opened up at the Lincoln Center and thought, well, wow, I need to have all the you know, good furniture, this and that, and the other thing. Of course, with my budget, I ended up with a lot of picnic chairs and, 
you know, <laughs> <laughs> things you take to the beach. Uh, and then I'd go to a lot of sales of companies either moving out of town or they were closing for whatever reason, they got bought out or for whatever reason they were gone and was able to really do well in the purchase of a lot of things. But years later, I kind of realized that maybe out of 500 clients I had in 20 years of doing business, over 500, maybe three would come to the office. I always went to them. Mm -hmm. right. That I could literally, the last, I'd say, five, six years, I didn't keep that office. Once um, the uh, building uh, asked us for smaller places to leave because the big company was taking over the whole thing, I thought, well, okay, I'll just put things in storage for a while and then look shop and see what I'm going to get as my next office space and realized it doesn't matter to anybody. Uh, so some of these businesses, you do need what you're saying, you need brick and mortar, you need a good address, but some, nobody cares anymore. No. They're like mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. good about mm -hmm. virtual things. Do you lend money to places that are virtual? We haven't. We can okay. look at it. We haven't. Though. You've got to see bricks and mortar yeah. in your, when you're lending <laughs> exactly. money. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you approach that at, at uh, the entrepreneurship uh, mm -hmm. major? Well, and, and certainly the idea, and we've been alluding to it throughout the discussion, and I'm a strong advocate of bootstrapping your business, and that's one of the things we teach, and especially in the service side, which is much easier to, to, to bootstrap. Um, I'll give an example of, of the six companies that were participants in our business accelerator in the Gazelle Lab. Um, None of them had a physical location, a permanent physical location. Uh, but one of the things that we did encourage, and, and, and Scott alluded to this as well, is uh, a co-work space that's uh, beginning to be popular uh, in the Tampa Bay area, uh, working around individuals that have the same energy uh, that you do, and that's one of the things that we're advocating. Um, through our 620 plan is that we need more of that. We need more hubs of entrepreneurial activity mm -hmm. where people can feed off of the energy uh, uh, of themselves, but at the same time have very viable workspace when needed. It is hard to be an entrepreneur on your own mm -hmm. because you, you're yeah. usually a work maniac in the yeah. first place, but yeah. then you have nobody to Kick ideas, Kick ideas mm -hmm. around. Yeah, it was another point that uh, I was thinking about when, when Scott was talking, and I think uh, in the Tampa market at least, being a member of the different cha one of the chambers at the very least, I was on the board of governors of the Greater Tampa Chamber for a period of time in the 90s, mm -hmm. uh, but I served on 24 nonprofit boards in Tampa. And I'd always say to a client, join boards which I think you alluded to, mm -hmm. um, join all kinds of organizations so you could network, mm -hmm. but especially make sure you choose them based on something you like. Don't choose mm -hmm. something you don't like. If you mm -hmm. don't like dealing with you know, abused children, don't join that group, mm -hmm. or foster children, or whatever, or animal rights, don't join that particular nonprofit because it might not turn into anything, but it could. And, mm -hmm. and if it doesn't turn into anything, at least you did what you thought was an exactly. important thing and it didn't turn into you know, a business thing. But mm -hmm. to your point, when you go to those meetings and you get involved in those committees and you're an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. you're losing money. Exactly. And nobody realizes it because you're sitting next to somebody who works for Raymond James or someplace else who's getting paid anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're at the meeting, they're at the committee meeting, and they're getting money. And when you're not at the committee meeting, you're getting nothing because you lost that hour because your goods are perishable. It, it's a great point. As chair of the Florence Sioux CPAs, they say you're probably gonna do 400 hours of billable time this year will be spent on, on chairing the statewide mm -hmm. organization. And we just had our, our board of governors meeting um, last uh, two weeks ago. And there's 31 CPAs there, and you know, you're there for two days, and we have meetings tomorrow and Thursday in a, at Tampa Airport committees where it's our state and local tax section committee, so helping CPAs around the state with understanding state and local taxes or federal tax issues. 
those CPAs, it's eight hours and there's 15, 20 people on a committee and there's probably, um, there's 1,800 CPAs in Florida involved in these committees. There's a lot of billable time that you don't have to get back. Mm -hmm. As your point, it's gone. And people, but then the payoff though is in the long run for that. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. on your, when you're on nonprofit organizations, I'm, I'm involved in junior achievement, again, free business and enterprise. Right. Well, I, there's a lot of bankers on there, you know, and you meet your banker who may fund this business for you, introduce you to this person. Mm -hmm. They pay off in the long run. But I think to your point is, if you do so many of these, you're not gonna be able to bill anybody for your time. Right. And yeah. so pick the ones that you're gonna have the passion about because it may fit into your organization or you have the passion about personally. And they will pay, they will pay off whether it's, uh, whether it's personally you'll, you're gonna grow professionally, financially, it will pay off in the long run. Sometimes yeah. it takes five years or so, but yeah, you'll definitely. hear from yeah. them. That's, yeah. that's, that's for sure. Oh, but I remember my accountant trying to rein me in from giving away my services to these nonprofits that I would be uh, involved with. And uh, what she tried to do was to say, okay, you need to tell everybody that uh, you, you uh, service nonprofits on Thursdays only, and you don't bill on Thursdays. But you are booked for the next five Thursdays. <laughs> so if they want you right away, they have to take a different day where there's yeah. billing. Yeah. I wish I'd have followed her advice. <laughs> um, I certainly did, but that yeah. is really smart, yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah. you've got to figure out how much of what you're doing you're going to give away. I'm going to ask each of you to uh, make your point without me asking a question that you think viewers really need to know about uh, uh, getting involved in financing their mm -hmm. business or expanding it and what advice you want to either repeat because you think it's very, very important or it's fresh and new from any discussion we already had. I'll start with you, Francis. Okay. Uh, one of the things that you brought up as about was bringing people into the uh, business and borrow money from the, from the family or friends. One of the things that uh, people can do is rather than putting that money in the business, put in a certificate of deposit at a bank, use that money as collateral on a loan. You can take $10,000 and use $100,000 of the bank's money by borrowing the money, getting your product, selling your product, paying the bank back. It's a cycle. So they can That's do that really over smart and over because again. Because your, your rate, I think I did that one mm -hmm. time when I bought a house like, mm -hmm. I don't know, 30 something years ago, mm -hmm. uh, using some of the money um, for a deposit or something mm -hmm. like that on the house as mm -hmm. the CD. So right. not taking that money out, because you know how afraid you are, you'll never put exactly. money back in savings once right. you took it out. <laughs> right. But then securing a lower interest rate. Right, of, uh, on a loan. Right, that's mm -hmm. a really good idea. Mm -hmm. Now you're saying uh, the person who's doing the business themselves could do that, Yes. the mm -hmm. entrepreneur, or they could have uh, an investor type person in their family e do it. Either or. If, you're borrow, if I was borrowing money from you mm -hmm. to put in my business, rather than taking, my, taking that money and putting it in my business, I would go to the bank, get a certificate of deposit, and borrow money from the bank using that certificate of de deposit as collateral. Or you take the certificate out in your name. I could. You could. It could be, I give you 10000 and you... Right, because I'm borrowing it from you, or it could be in your name, then you just have to hypothecate it to me for my business. Okay. Anything else you want to make sure you uh, emphasize here? They can go to our website. Go ahead. It's www.tampabaybbic.com. They can download our application um, and they give us give us a call, uh, and we'll schedule an appointment to come out to them. And or, pester you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Fred. You're Scott. Welcome. It's not going to be any uh, coincidence that mine's going to be focused on accounting records <laughs> and what the accounting records you need at the beginning. As Francis was going to, as Francis said. They're looking for business projections in your business plan. Um, you need to go out and meet with your CPA and understand what type of records do I need to have? Because if you do not have it straight from the beginning, getting it straight at the end is going to cost you a lot of money, whether it's in taxes or penalties, or whether it's paying a CPA to fix your records for you. There are plenty of ways to have accounting software for small businesses that are out there that you don't have to host in your own environment. You can access it um, you know, from a company in Canada or, or California or Florida that has these um, different software packages that are $19.95 a month or 
almost free because they show you advertisements up there, you know, as you as you do your accounting, keeping you awake, I guess. I, but the main point is setting up a good chart of accounts, making sure your accounting records are straight because the person that loaned you money, whether it's a friend, family member, a, a community investment organization, the bank, they're going to want to see that on a continual basis, as well as then it's going to help the CPA file your taxes. It's worth the money when people say, oh geez, I don't want to go to the CPA, it's going to cost this amount of money, I'm concerned that's too much money. I tell the IRS, the Department of Revenue Tax and Penalties, just for filing a document that says you did no business and you don't owe them any money, then you actually do, is something that's going to be a problem. So get down to your CPA, make sure you have a good chart set up and stick to the accounting records or else it's going to hurt you in the long run. Of course, you don't like those like Ah, here's my shoebox. Shoe box. <laughs> exactly. We have a Please, shoebox fee. Do. <laughs> Can you figure out where this belongs? I think this was for a meal. I'm not mm -hmm. sure. Blah, blah. This is supplies, whatever, right? Yeah. I, I think if I would leave us with, with anything, it's uh, hopefully the community will become interested in our Tampa Bay 620 plan. I think we need to build an ecosystem around entrepreneurship. Uh, we need to develop pipelines uh, for financing. Uh, we need to expand that in all areas across uh, all levels of entrepreneurship. We also need to encourage those students that are interested in entrepreneurship to look at some of the programs in the local area. You know, those are our future entrepreneurial leaders and we want them to be excited and uh, if, if our program is not the one for them, look at other academic programs in the area but um, those kids are bright and I think at some point they will help us be able to say that we have the Founders Coast right here in the Tampa Bay area. What's a 620? For those the, the 620 plan is an initiative for creating an ecosystem of entrepreneurship. Is that a the, government number or something? No, or it's actually... Uh, you, uh, you, uh, you came it, up with a name the, that's a number? It's from the philosophy of it takes six entrepreneurs uh, to start an ecosystem that it may take 20 years to build, but it was also released on June the 20th, so uh, there's a double implication there. But, you know, one of the things that we are really lacking in this community is a strong financial base that our entrepreneurship community uh, can turn to. And, and that's at all levels. Uh, you know, but the high growth firms and, and keeping them from leaving the Tampa Bay area. Oh, please, with three sons and two that don't live here. Oh, come on. Yeah, and, could we not yeah. let them go to Houston and, and D.C., please, and bring them home? Absolutely. That's the biggest problem we all have. We go get them educated elsewhere, and then they, yeah. they don't come back. And the healthier that community becomes, the more successful all of us can be in the entrepreneurship community. I left off um, Internet-based businesses. Um, you don't need as much and does, does anybody have any feeling about where all that's going or just hit on the right idea kind of thing or well on internet sales there there's coming you know right now everyone says well I can buy this because it's in California I live in Florida and it's tax-free they're gonna start working on close that loophole as well so like you were saying the infrastructure is gonna be less but look at sales tax issues that may come into play and may affect your pricing of how you compare it to someone in Connecticut, et cetera. Also, it would be extremely hard to finance an inter internet-based business because there's nothing you can wrap your arms no around. No bricks, no mortar, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Thank okay. you very much, all of you, for uh, spending some time with us and uh, conveying your expertise to our viewers. I really appreciate it. I hope to see you back here again. Uh, thanks again, and thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time.